Here we are at the end of 2016. 2,200 years after the story of Hanukkah unfolded. And here we are, and the story is repeating itself, as it has many times before. Millions of our fellow Americans have told us that they are scared, that they are really scared, that they see this multicultural, pluralistic, global world that is being built as another Hellenization process. And they are scared. They are scared because they feel that in that great march forward, they are being left behind. They are scared because Because as this global, multicultural, capitalistic project is moving forward, they find themselves, their families, their children, growing ever more poor. Not benefiting from the fruit of abundance, the supposed abundance. They are scared because they see their values their beliefs being dismissed, disrespected, rejected. They're scared because they feel that their way of life is being eroded, quickly eroded. They're scared because who they feel they are, what they stand for, in this great march forward is being asked to dissolve and to die out. They are scared. Mostly they are afraid to disappear. And there is nothing like death to bring within us fear and anger. We we didn't listen. We, We didn't hear the pain. We didn't hear the fear. You know, we were those Hellenizers so happy to move forward with this newfound prosperity and um, pluralistic consciousness that is moving forward. We, we were so happy to wear the togas and to call our kids Alexander and to study the philosophers and go to the sports arenas that we closed ourselves off from listening to those angry voices, to those fearful ones who called out to us to say, I don't feel part of this. You're not including me in this. We built walls between us and them. We started to plug our ears to whatever it was they were saying. We even called them names. And they knew it. And as we walled ourselves off, they did the same. We, we created around ourselves our own little bubble, you know, our echo chambers, where we only invited those who thought like us, who saw the world like us, who wanted what we wanted. And we stopped listening. But that didn't... The fact that we couldn't hear it anymore didn't stop the, the anger from rising. And so, we 
when um, one of those politicians came to the surface and in his speeches and in his stump speech and in his rallies told them that he heard them mirrored back at them their anger their resentment told them he was going to fix everything They didn't care about anything else. They wanted their voice to be heard again. They wanted to not die. And so en masse, they came out and voted for that person. Especially in those states, you know, who really saw the train of global prosperity leave the station without them. You know, the rust belt states, especially them. So, I don't know, I'm making maybe a judgment call, but the worst that could happen, happened. And anger and fear elected what seems to be turning into a threat, a threat to our democracy, a threat to the ecosystem of our planet, and it seems more and more a threat to um, global peace. We will have to fight that threat. We will have to stand up and fight any government that will defile the constitution of our country, that would step on the values of our democracy, that would put in jeopardy the ecosystem of our natural world. We will have to fight, stand up and fight a government that will restrict liberties, promote hatred, bigotry and racism. We will have to fight that president and that government. Our fight will be with him. Our fight cannot be with our fellow Americans. Our fight is not with them. And I want you perhaps to hear that. Because they too will fall victim to whatever policies are coming. Perhaps even more so than we might. Because make no mistakes, that president-elect is already publicly, on TV, in front of cameras, denying, disavowing the promises he made at these very rallies to these very people, saying that it was just made-up slogans to get votes, that he never believed in anything he said to them. Our mistake was that, again, we closed ourselves from our neighbors, that we refused to hear. And we no longer can do that. We can no longer do this because it is not sustainable. We need to tear down those walls and use the bricks to build bridges between us. We need to be able to sit across the table with those who voted against what we voted and genuinely, deeply listen to them. Hear their fears. Hear their concerns. Hear their worldview, their perspective. And not just listen, but really integrate it. Really grok it. 
really make it part of our understanding of the world as it is. Because the truth of the matter is that's what we want. I mean, think about it. That's what we want. Whatever society, whatever world we want to create next, because we are who we are, we want it to be a world, we want it to be a society that is inclusive of everyone. Not just the elite few that think like us. We're not interested in creating an economy, a society, a democracy that would only work for us and not them. That's not who we are. We know that whatever it is that we envision for our future, for our children's future, it will have to be beneficial to all beings. Because that's who we are. That's what we want. We want a society that works for everybody. You know, sometimes I also fall into this delusion that perhaps we could have a two-state solution here. It doesn't work in Israel. Maybe we could have it here. Let's have a two-state solution for America. But you know, it's not possible. It's not possible. I mean, we can dream it, but it's not possible. We are one nation. We are one people. We live together side by side with our neighbors. We rise together as one nation. We fall together as one nation. There is no way around that. We have to make room at the table. We have to listen and we have to seek healing what is broken. Make better our fellow Americans' suffering wherever they are. Whatever color their faces are, whatever religion they practice, whatever language they speak, it doesn't matter. It's true for all. We cannot exclude any one of them. And if we do like the Greek empire did and fight them, both sides will lose. Because when we are divided, the demagogues, that prey on division, fear and anger will be elected and re-elected and re-elected and re-elected. So yes, we will need to fight tyranny if it happens to raise its dark, dark head in our country. Yes, we will need to do that, all of us. This is not a time to sit in meditation with our eyes closed. It is a time to sit in meditation with our eyes closed if we are there to source within the deepest recess of our heart the next most appropriate, most loving, more compassionate move there is to keep democracy and compassion alive. This is not a time to leave for the next ashram. This is the time to stand and fight. Our destiny is bound up in their destiny. Now you know, I told you on Rosh Hashanah that this year was going to be a powerful year told you the year 5777 in Kabbalah is the year that holds the name of God. In the Gematria, the Kabbalah, this year bears the name of God. And I told you, this was the year of a great awakening in consciousness. And you probably thought that 
it would come dropped in your lap in a nice little box with a beautiful wrapping paper and a bow on top. Because it was in October. <laughs> But that's never how shifts in awareness and consciousness happen. They happen at the time of crisis. And we are in the middle of a major crisis in consciousness right now. We are facing a Hanukkah moment right now. You know how we know when consciousness grows another step forward, another step higher? The mark for that is that when we rise to a higher level of consciousness, we are better able to be more and more inclusive. We are ever better to take more and more perspectives. That's the marker of a higher level of consciousness. The more perspectives you are able to integrate within your being, the higher you rank on the levels of consciousness. This moment is calling us to embrace this opportunity to see the world through peop other people's eyes, people that we would... On another, in another time, probably would not even look at. But we are called upon to walk a mile in their shoes, to see the world through their eyes, to understand their perspective, their worldview, so that we can expand our consciousness by taking yet another perspective as part of who we are, that we can hold, not reject, hold and appreciate, and embrace. And that's the time at hand. That's the moment where consciousness is shifting. So we can either fall back into the hatred and bar barricade ourselves behind the walls again, point the finger and recreate an us versus them, and miss that opportunity. Or we can embrace the challenge. Challenge ourselves is going to be challenging, my people. It's challenging. I've been reading Fox News every day. <laughs> every day. Not just one article. And you're laughing, but I'm learning. I can't, you can't. And I learn to appreciate. I learn to appreciate. And if you're a Republican, I invite you to watch MSNBC, read the Washington Post, whichever, I don't know. The Huffington Post, that will be a challenge. No. I am serious. This is our only chance. And this is the challenge. So this is Hanukkah. And for eight days, we're going to find ourselves lighting candles, then two candles, then three candles every day to bring a little more light into our world, to bring a little more light into our life. May that light be a light of awakening, be a light of embracing, be a light of inclusion, be a light that will help us grow in awareness and in consciousness this year. Amen.